So today's video is going to be about DNA and it's going to focus on the structure and function of the DNA molecule in particular. So remember, these are your notes, draw pictures, um, write down information that's said, not just information that's on the slide. Remember, make these personal to you so that you can use them and you have a good resource or study tool when it comes to labs and when it comes to preparing for tests and quizzes. Okay, so here on this slide, I just want to point out quickly um, some different people. So the two gentlemen that we have here on the left are Watson and Crick. Watson and Crick were important in determining the 3D structure of DNA, and we'll talk about what that means in a little bit. Um, but that was their major contribution to science at the time, is that they helped determine this 3D structure of DNA. And this wasn't really that long ago. This was probably about 60 years ago. Um, Rosalind Franklin over here on the right, she is an important name that you guys will need to remember. She took these pictures right here. Okay. These are x-ray images that she took, and Watson and Crick over on the left there would not have been able to determine that 3D structure of DNA without her images. Um, be, but because of the time frame that this was, because she was a female, she was not necessarily given um, all the credit that she should have been given at the time. But she is credited with taking these x-ray diffraction pictures that allowed them to determine this 3D image. Okay, so I know this slide looks like a lot, so just kind of bear with me a little bit. Remember, you can rewind, you can pause. We're not actually going to take that much from this slide. We're going to break it down little by little in further subsequent slides. So some key points that we need from this here is that DNA is in the shape of what we call a double helix. That is this shape over here. This It's sometimes called a twisted ladder. That's how you can picture what that double helix is going to look like. Okay, so you'll have the two strands of DNA that are going to cross and be in that twisted ladder format. So DNA is in a double helix. It's got two strands that make up the entire, two halves that make up the entire strand of DNA. DNA itself is a polymer. We will talk more in depth about polymers and monomers on our next video, but we do need the basic idea of what a polymer is right now. Okay, so a polymer, these are, as a general rule, these are going to be very large molecules made of smaller molecules. So very large molecules made up of smaller molecules. The smaller molecules that make up the polymer is called a monomer. Mono meaning one. And on our next slide, we're going to look at the polymer, the polymer and monomer a little bit closer, but I just want to get the idea from here. So if we focus right here in the middle on this um, picture of DNA, this whole thing, all of this here in the middle, that would be a polymer, larger molecule made up of smaller molecules. And then these smaller molecules right here, each one of these that you'll notice they're kind of repetitive, okay? those are the monomers. So when I link a whole bunch of those together, I get the polymer. Think Lego sets, right? I have a giant Lego set to build um, Harry Potter's castle. That's what my daughter has. So she has a giant Lego set for Harry Potter's castle. Well, the finished product, the castle, is the polymer. The individual Legos that were used to build that castle, those are our monomers. So let's focus on the monomer of DNA specifically. So the monomer of DNA is a nucleotide. So this is our monomer of DNA as well as RNA, but we'll talk more about RNA later. So our monomer of DNA here is a nucleotide and that nucleotide has three parts. It has a nitrogen base, it has a pentose sugar, which is a, what this means here with the five C is a five carbon sugar. We'll look at that picture in just a second. Um, and it has a phosphate group attached to it. You've got to remember these three parts of a nucleotide. Okay. This is like a foundational have to get. Nucleotide is the monomer of the nucleic acids, so DNA and RNA. And the, that nucleotide will consist of nitrogen base, a five carbon sugar, and a phosphate group. 
<clears throat> let's look at the nitrogen base for just a second. The nitrogen base, when we look at images for these things, if we come over to the right, these are going to be our nitrogen bases. Okay, so that'll be the nitrogen bases. We'll, when we get into complementary base pairing, we'll look at the names of these in a little bit. A, um, the pentose sugar or the five carbon sugar, that would be the green here. In DNA, that pentose sugar is called deoxyribose. In RNA, it's called ribose. So in DNA, that pentose sugar is called deoxyribose. And then the phosphate group would be represented by this little circle here. And we'll build some models, you know, color some pictures to help reinforce this. Okay, but we're going to always have a nitrogen base, a five carbon sugar, and a phosphate group. And that phosphate group, you can see how it has all these negatives on it. That phosphate group is going to give DNA overall a negative charge, which will be really important. I know this seems like a long time from now, but at the end of the year when we do um, DNA fingerprinting, gel electrophoresis, um, that will come into play. The fact that DNA is going to have a negative charge. Okay, so let's look a little bit closer at these nitrogen bases and the, the different classifications of the nucleotide. Remember, the nucleotide is the monomer. And again, it has that carbon, that nitrogen base, and that phosphate group. So we have two basic types of nucleotides. We have a purine and a pyrimidine. Purines are going to be those double-ringed structures um, that we saw on the other on the other picture, how some had two rings and some just had one ring, the purines are going to be the double ring structure. Those are going to be adenine and guanine. Okay? So two rings, adenine and guanine. The pyrimidines are going to have just one nitrogen ring, and that will be cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Okay? Uracil is only in RNA and thymine is only in DNA. So a way that we can help you hopefully remember these is if you remember this little saying that pyrimidines are cut from purines. Hey, this isn't exactly true. It's not, we don't take a, a double purine ring and like chop half of it off and now that's the pyrimidine. But this is hopefully letting you know that pyrimidines are smaller than purines and the cut part tells you which ones they are. So pyrimidines are cytosine, uracil, thymine. Again, pyrimidines are cytosine, uracil, thymine. Add your own information right off, you know, to the side like this so you know what the cut stands for. Do stuff, remember to make these your own notes. So pyrimidines are cut cytosine uracil thymine from purines. One of the also ways that I remember this too is that the bigger the word, so the bigger the word, the smaller the ring. So pyrimidine, big giant word, only one ring. Purine, nice, short, easy word, two rings, bigger molecule. Okay, so hopefully this image is still is familiar to you. We looked at this previously. So remember we said that the DNA itself is a polymer. So I've got to put lots of these monomers together. So again, remembering this monomer structure, right? Here is one nucleotide right here, right? That's a monomer. Whole bunch of those put together gives me, right, that polymer. So nucleotide, here's my monomer. I've got the phosphate, I've got the five carbon sugar, and the nitrogen base. This particular nitrogen base is a uh, pyrimidine, a, a single ring. So it's either a cytosine, a uracil, or a thymine. Well, it's a cytosine or a thymine. It can't be a uracil because we're talking about DNA here. So when we build these monomers together, we link them like Legos and we stack them all together into a polymer, a, we end up with a sugar phosphate backbone as part of our DNA structure. So we end up with this backbone right here. 
this sugar phosphate backbone, which is repetitive. It's the, exactly the same in all organisms, as in from person to person, we all have the same sugar phosphate backbone. From person to penguin, to cricket, to bacteria, we all have the same sugar phosphate backbone. And just this constant sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. It's the nitrogen bases that are gonna be different and the nitrogen, the order of the nitrogen bases is what's going to actually make us all different. Okay, so the order of the nitrogen bases, okay, that determines the genetic information. The order or the sequence of the nitrogen bases, that is what makes you, you. That's what makes the penguin different from us. That's what makes the bacterial organism different from us is the order of those nitrogen bases. So those nitrogen bases will pair up. I do find this a little bit misleading where the little penguin down here says matching bases. Okay, we're gonna use the term complementary. They do not match in the sense that A never goes with A. A it's so there's a pattern, a purine to pyrimidine pattern that you can see here, right? Here's my pyrimidine of thymine. Here's my purine of adenine. So I always have a purine pyrimidine going together. And the bonding rules are A to T, C to G. And those never change. So if I had, if I gave you a strand of like half of a strand of DNA that looked like this, you would be able to build the other half by using my complementary base pairing rules. A goes to T, T goes to A, C with G, G with C, A with T, T with A. And those rules are unbidden. There are no exceptions. Any exceptions is going to end up with a mutation and a problem. Okay, and these base pairs are going to be held together by hydrogen bonds. It doesn't matter how many. Don't get bogged down in, oh, we need two or we need three. Okay, but these are all hydrogen bonds that are holding these base pairs together. That's going to be really important when we talk about DNA replication. Okay, but what you need to know right now about a hydrogen bonds is that these are a relatively weak bond meaning that they can be broken relatively easily so that we can access the information. So hydrogen bonds will hold those purines and pyrimidines together as they complementary base pair to one another. Okay, we're not gonna focus much on replication here. We're gonna talk about replication in depth when we do cell cycle and mitosis. Um, the only thing you need from here is that these two strands are complementary, meaning again, if I have an A, that goes with a T. If I have a G, that goes with a C. And remember, I've got those hydrogen bonds between them, holding them together. This is also not a super major topic that we're going to focus on. I'm going to number these carbons for you really quickly. One, two three, four, and five. This is um, one of the things that'll show up as more important in AP biology. What you really need to know right now is that our two DNA strands are considered anti-parallel. And again, when we get into, um, when we get into uh, DNA replication, we'll talk about this some more. If you'll notice these carbons here, each of these little corners represents a carbon. So carbon, carbon, carbon. Each of those corners represents a carbon. So I've numbered the carbons one, two, three, four, and five. Where I can make my DNA strand longer is at the three prime end. And so what will happen is when I have my two DNA strands, right, my two halves of my DNA here, I'm going to end up with a three prime. So that ends on carbon number three. So that represents the third carbon is what's dangling. This is the fifth carbon. 
and the two strands are anti-parallel. You'll notice they're opposites of one, they essentially run opposite directions. That's kind of all you need to know right now, that they run opposite directions or anti-parallel, and that is because of that complementary base pairing. Remember, if I have an A, T, G, G, T situation, right, I end up with a T, A, C, C, A, right, and you'll notice how they run opposite directions. Okay, and so I'd have a five prime to three prime end and a three prime to, I'm sorry, a five prime to three prime end, then running anti-parallel. So this is what we just talked about, right? I end up with that, again, that three prime end on the backbone and the five prime end on that repetitive backbone. Remember, simplify this down some if you need it. Don't get lost in all the, the minutia right? Here's my sugar. Here's my phosphate. Here's my sugar. Here's my phosphate. There's that repeating sugar phosphate backbone, right? With the nitrogen bases in the middle. And so as I mentioned, we end up with these anti-parallel strands. So I have one strand that's running um, in the three to five prime direction and the other running the opposite three to five prime direction. And we'll model this in class. Okay, and as we're going to wrap things up with these last few slides, you'll notice some of it's going to be repetitive. So just, you know, add anything that you missed maybe the first time. Okay, so just a reminder, right, in DNA, I've got this polymer. Therefore, I'm going to have to have bonds because I have a polymer. I have a lots of little molecules put together into a big molecule. Okay, we don't, I don't need you to know that this is a covalent phosphodiester bond. What I need you to know is that the backbone has a big strong bond, right? The backbone has strong bonds, therefore they're gonna be difficult to break apart, which is good. We don't wanna break the backbone up. The hydrogen bonds holding those nitrogen bases are weaker bonds so that we can open that up to read the information. Remember, the information is all about the order of those nitrogen bases. And so to get to the information, I've got to be able to get to those nitrogen bases. And so just a reminder here that the, the nitrogen bases, really let's go ahead and add in the sequence of the nitrogen bases carry the genetic code. And so that's where the instructions for particular traits, for particular proteins, that's all going to be carried in the order of those bases. A, um, that's going to determine the amino acids in a protein. We're going to talk about proteins in our next video, um, but you'll realize that proteins essentially control everything within an organism. That's how the DNA has the instructions for everything because it has the instructions for making proteins. Okay? And so the order of those nitrogen bases are going to determine that information. Okay, so that wraps up today's video. We'll do, like I said, we'll do modeling with this. Um, we'll uh, work with some pictures and we'll be practicing a lot with the structure and function of DNA. If you have any questions about anything, you need to have marked it in your notes, um, written them off to the side, something so that when we come into class, you can ask them. It is crucial that if there's something you didn't understand, you make note of that so that you can ask that question when we come into class and therefore your activities, your labs, your reinforcement is going to be more clear for you.